And tonight, looking for a demonstrator, we had a couple of members jump in and say, we'd like to be involved. And Paul Hannaby is uh, with us tonight. He's got one set up in the shop. Paul, are you ready, sir? Yep, I'm ready. All right, Paul, we're going to spotlight you, sir. Uh, Dave, can uh, Doug, can you do that? There we go. Thanks. Um, yeah, before, before we get on to the demo, just um, something I thought up about um, one of the questions earlier about turning a wet piece of wood. Um, this one, this is a piece of oak. This was turned out of a branch of a small oak tree that I cut down in the back garden. It was, it was in the wrong place, so um, I moved it. Um, but you can see the, the cup there. This was turned green literally within days of cutting it down or cutting this branch off it. Um, the cup there hasn't cracked because it's turned moderately thin. The foot end, which I never sort of quite finished turned, you can see it's got a big split in it because the, that's the pith. The center of that is, is pretty much where the pith is. And, and you can see what's happened there, the, the, the typical sort of radial cracks because the wood's contracted as it's dried and shrunk. So thick piece like that, as it dries, it's, it's gonna crack. If you turn it thin enough, it won't crack. So that's the other approach to it. Instead of trying to dry the wood without it cracking, which in end grain is not always successful, what you can do is turn it thin. And by thin, I would say, under about three sixteenths, give or take. I mean, that, that one is probably about eighth of an inch thick. Um, so if you, if, you, if you keep the sort of three, three sixteenths and less, then you're improving the odds of it drying without splitting because by reducing the thickness of the wood and making it consistently that thick, hopefully it will dry without splitting because you're allowing the wood to move. Those stresses will still happen as the wood dries, but instead of the wood splitting, it will just move, it will distort. Um, so Paul, we'll need... Paul, pardon me, I've always learned that you need to be uniform. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, keep the, keep the, the wall thickness consistent and that, that evens out the drying across the whole piece and, and that should minimise the chances of it splitting as well. Okay, okay so, so um, on, on to the rest of the evening, as I say. Um, I've got something else I was going to show you as well. The, there. What I've got here, this, this is one of my improvised tools. It's a, it's a slow cooker. Um, I've got a temperature control on the end here, which is sort of thermostatically controlled. And I've taken out the ceramic tray and just filled it with wax. And this, this is mostly paraffin wax. Um, there is some other types of wax in there as well, but it's all, it's all works the same way. But what I do with this is I, I, when I'm preparing wet blanks, I switch this on, let that melt. The, 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 the thermostat here keeps that at about 90 degrees centigrade. Um, and then I can just dip my blanks end on into there, or if I cut a bowl blank, I can just rotate it in the liquid wax and, and seal the, the blank and then put it away. So uh, just a quick tip there. Put that away. Um, so yeah, what we're going to do this evening is, is make um, a small bud vase and colour it. So I've got here, this is the, the plan for this evening, it's, a, it's an ash blank, roughly three by three by eight inches in length. Um, I quite like using ash for these because I think it's, it's quite a versatile wood in terms of being light enough to take colour and we can also do grain enhancement techniques on it because it's quite open grain so it um, lends itself to, to lots of experimentation which is what I like to do. So I'm just going to mark the end of the blank and I'm just using my pencil and locking my fingers together to do it the, the quick way. Draw some lines on that end. Same the blank away. Same on the other end. So I've just ended up with a little box on each end. And then to pick my centre on this is a that's an automatic centre punch. Costs a few pounds or a few dollars from your hardware shop. Put that in the middle, just push and it makes an indentation. And that helps me locate it on the centres. Okay, so that's ready to roll. I've got I've got here um, the drive centre mounted in my truck. I could put it straight into the morse tape with that. You can see there, I've got a morse tape adapter that goes into the truck. 
So um, just clean things up a little bit. On the head. Um, so I can use those marks I've put there to center the plank, put it between centers there. So that's just held between centers, and then I'll drive that in with a couple of turns on the hand wheel on the tail stop. So now I've engaged the teeth to give me some drive. And then once I've done that, I'll put, I've got, I'll just move, move my camera that way. I'm just locking the um, locking the, the, the lever on the, the tail stop here to, to lock the tail stop the quill where it is. Let's see if we lose the camera. Yeah. Good. Uh, bring the tool rest. And I've got, as I've got a square blank, I'm setting this up on one of the corners. So I've got a small gap there, let's say about a quarter of an inch gap. Um, lock the boundary in place. I've got the tool rest at about the right height, so if I needed to adjust that, I would. And once I've set this on one side, I'll rotate the blank just to make sure that none of the other corners are going to hit the rest. And you can see I'm turning that away rather than towards. There's a simple answer to why. If I don't get my thumb out of the way and I go the other way, that one hurts. First, that one doesn't. So um, I'll push that away. So I'm going to start off with a spindle rough and gauge. This one's a three quarter inch, but um, size isn't critical here. I've got my lane speed set to minimum. I've got my visor on my head already. And um, I can put that down so my voice might sound a little bit more boomy. But uh, hopefully it's okay. Um, so what I'll do is I'll stand out of the firing line. If I switch to that camera, you can possibly see me. Just pull it around a bit. So I'm standing, here's my controls and head stop in front of me. So I'm standing in line with the head stop, not in line with the piece of wood. So when I start the lay, I'm out of the firing line. So if I have stopped and did, and that comes off, I'm not in the firing line. So we must speed up slowly. So I'm just looking to see if there's any on vibrations or anything like that. So it's how I get it to do, looking at the wall. So I've got that up to about 1500 RPM now. Um, so that's good, it's good at that speed. So I'm happy with that, safe and secure, and I can switch back to that, that, that camera and stand in front of that. And I'm confident that it's not going to come off. So put my tool on the rest, put it against the wood with the handle low, and it's not touching there. And I'll lift the handle up, and I'll put the handle in front of that, and I'm actually making a cut. And I'm touching from the wood to the end, not the other way. If I cut in from the end, at the point where the cut starts, I've got no double contact and no support. And that's no control. So with each cut, a little bit farther. You see I'm effectively cutting the tape over And I'll get near to the other end. You see I'm cutting the other direction. You can see that gap now, it's quite a bit. What was a quarter of an inch is now three quarters of an inch or more. So I'll bring my rest in, lock it down again, and you can see I've still got some flaps here. There might be the slight flat on it, but at this point that's not too difficult to do anyway. So that looks okay. Um, there's a little nick there, which is, I think it's just a strange little mark in the drain. It looks like it actually bent, but it's not. Um, so that's round. Now what I want to do is to make that fit into my chuck. So I need to create a spigot on one end or the other. And at this point, I'll look at the blank and see if there's one end that's worse than the other end. In this case, there isn't actually both ends are pretty good. I've got my calipers here, here already set to fit the 
his door. Um, and I, I will have adjusted that with the door about sort of four to an inch or thereabouts open, sort of three sixteenths to four inch. Um, so I've got my divided step. I start with a parking tool on the end, straighten on the end, just to create that initial shoulder. And once I've got that running, I can run my mouth is on the door. Do the quite steep drawers. Um, I've got quite an overhang here with that flag, so I'm making a pretty long enough figure. That's just the right diameter. Um, so that's, that's all I need to do between centres. So I can put my rest out of the way. Paul, oh, have you have you dropped onto your um, camera mic rather than your normal mic because your sound when your lathe's running is coming through far better than your voice? And I know normally when you do a demo, they're they're very clear. Yeah, it's hard. Is that better? That's far better. Thank you. Yeah, well spotted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it was using my mic on my laptop. Right. Sorry, what was that? I said we were just getting the murmuring in the background and the big lathe noise and, and what you'll be saying. Oh, okay. Is... Yeah, yeah, it was, um, for some reason, Zoom set itself back to my computer internal mic instead of the one I've got on my head. So, no, that wouldn't have helped very much. But, yeah, we switched to the right one now. Yep. So, this is much, much, much well. better. Yeah. Good, good. Right, I shall continue. Um, sorry about that. Hopefully... You can hear what I'm doing from now on. So I'll set that to, to go into the chuck there. I'm just going to take the live center out. I make two versions of these vases. Um, you can see here I've got a blank I've already prepared. This one I've drilled already. Um, I can't drill it on this though, I'll do it on the other ones, but um, rather than me change cameras over there and set that up, I've, um, I've pre-drilled it. Um, what I've drilled it for is to put a tube in like this. This one's plastic. You can use glass if you want, but I find that when you take these things to craft shows and things like that, pick, people pick them up and look at the bottom and the tubes fall out. So, so unless you stick it in with a bit of blue tack or something like that, then they end up on the floor. So plastic ones bounce better, I find. So um, that's what I use. And that's, that's drilled to go in there. It's actually drilled slightly bigger. These tubes are 16 millimetres diameter. Um, I've drilled that hole 17 millimetres diameter. And the reason for that is these, these woods are well stabilised to my workshop humidity. But I know if I take that into the, the house where it's centrally heated, the humidity will be lower and that piece of wood will contract slightly. <clears throat> so if I drill it too, too tight to the tube, it'll grip the tube and I won't be able to get it out again. Um, I can put it back in the workshop for a couple of days and, and then it will come out, but that's no good if I'm trying to sell it to someone. I don't want that to happen to, a, to somebody who buys one of these. So I'll make sure there's a, a little bit of slack on the, the hole I drill. This one I haven't drilled, the one I've just turned. I'm just going to do that with a much smaller hole than do what I call a weed pot, um, which won't have a tube, tube in. That'll be just for dried grasses and dried flowers and things like that. So um, that one I won't drill, but hopefully we can at least have time to turn both of these. I'm just taking my tail stock away to give me a bit of space. Um, so I'll, I'll do the one, the what I call the weed pot first, um, this one with, without a hole drilled in it. So I put that in the chuck. I'm just pushing the center of the blank with my finger so it's bedding hopefully evenly against the jaws rather than grabbing it sideways and doing that because the tendency is to tip it one way or the other so if you just push it in on the end and then lock the chuck there yeah that's right Martin you can buy those tubes in all sorts of places just look for plastic test tubes or or test tubes uh, they are very easily available I buy them by the hundred usually so I've got a box full of them I'm just setting my 
to all rest up to run across the end of the blank. Um, what I want to do initially is to square that blank off. Let's have a look there. Um, so I'm going to cut across. That's got to come down just a fraction. This, this is, when I cut these blanks, I've just done that by eye on the bandsaw. So that's, there's no guarantee that's cut square. It's not far off, but it, it does need truing up. A little bit of vibration there for me pushing too hard. So I've squared the end off. Now what I want to do is to make a hole. And for these weed pots, what I've got here is, um, this is a 3 8 spindle gauge, and I'm just gonna drill with the 3 8 gauge. So I'm just setting my tool rest, so it's exactly on center. Just there, that looks about right. I'll just drop the speed down as well. I'll probably come down to about five or six hundred RPM because this is going to create a lot of heat. Oh, you so just push the tool in. Rest of center. You're talking about the tip of the tool, though, tack at center. Sorry, I missed that. Can you say that again? That you said you'll set the tool rest for center. That what you're meaning for novice turners is the point of the tip will be at center. Yeah, what I want is the tip of that. Um, effectively the tip of the flute to be dead on center so my tool is cutting dead on center height um, as, as in the case of a drill watch this close uh, 600. trick that's just drifted off slightly so i'm just going to clean that up by using the, the gauge effectively as a scraper and then start again push it in If it runs off, you, you can clean the hole up. But hopefully once you've got it going, this is a little bit off this one, but I'm not gonna worry about it too much. And I'm just going half an inch or so, clearing the shavings and then going again. So you see there, I've gone in about three inches or so. Let's do one more. That'll do it. So I can bring my speed back up now, about 1500 RPM. And I want to shape the inside of the top. So I'm just switching to a conventional fingernail grind half inch spindle gauge. And I'll start at the hole and pull towards the edge. I've got the flute at about 60 degrees. Let me just turn the lathe off there. <coughs> just explain what I'm doing. I've got the flute pointing to my left at an angle of about 60 degrees. So imagine that flute pointing at your left shoulder. That's about right. Um, and what I'm doing is going in with the tool, parallel with the bed, and then I'll draw it back towards me. Remember this is end grain. So in, then grain hollowing, you cut from centre to edge. So I start in the middle and pull up, pull outwards. And as I pull the tool out, I also swing it around like that. Let's do the overhead shot. You'll see what I mean. Start off straight, and I finish the cut around here. Paul, while you're there uh, in that view, um, it, it, that's a good place for you to explain why you go from the bottom to the top because of the grain yeah. and go downhill cuts. Sure. You can see here, the grain is running along the cylinder. So imagine my fingers are the grain fibers. Um, so in the inside of the hole, I'm gonna have a taper that way from center outwards. If I cut from the edge to center, what's gonna happen here is when I push the grain, I start to push the fibers apart because they're not supporting each other. If I cut the other way, each fiber is supported by the one behind it. The exception is when you get right to the edge. When you get to the edge, there's nothing supporting it because you've run out of wood. So it'll splinter off the edge if you're not careful. So I'll cut this almost to the edge and stop. Um, so that, that hopefully explains the, you can see the, the grain direction there. 
So, so we're cutting centre to edge. Thank you, Paul. Okay. So, um, flute at about 60 degrees. If that feels too aggressive, rotate it slightly more anti-clockwise. If you want to make it a bit more aggressive, then rotate it slightly clockwise. But don't go beyond, if you imagine that's pointing at about 10 o'clock on the clock face, don't go beyond about 11. You get, you get too flat with the flute, and what will happen is that, that edge will dig in. So um, that's, that's what we're trying to avoid here. So just pulling that around, keeping the tool <clears throat> pretty much horizontal in relation to the tool rest. So I've given that a bit of shape from the top. And I can just go back to that small gauge and just make sure the edge of the hole is looking tidy. And hopefully, because I've followed the grain direction, I've, I've got a reasonable cut there. Um, if I want to just refine that, I could take a couple of light cuts to finish. I think that will leave me a good enough surface to sand. So I'll, I'll go with that. Bring the tool rest round to the side now. <clears throat> and I can see there just a slight flat that I left earlier. Um, I, I normally don't worry too much about that because when you take a blank from between centres and then mount it in the chuck, the compression of the, the spigot that you formed might just throw the blank off slightly. So the first thing I'm going to have to do with this is true it up. As it happens, this one is running pretty true. But if it wasn't, the first thing I would do is just take a couple of light cuts along the outside of that just to true it up. So if there was a remaining flat, I would lose it at that point. So I, I don't sort of dwell on removing that flat um, at the point where I'm roughing it between centres. Um, so what I'm going to do here shape-wise is your typical hourglass, which is the top half is effectively a cove, the bottom half is a, half's a bead, um, and then bottom's going to be somewhere around about there. So um, you've got a lot of scope here for shape and sort of creative influence, if you want to call it that. So if we say the lowest point of the cove is going to be round about there, I can just work from each side of that point. And you can take the, the tip of the, or the top of the vase to be that width. You can narrow it down a bit. It depends on what you prefer in terms of shape, really. I'm here I'm going to do quite a long neck and potentially a short base. The base is about that much of it, I suppose. So it's sort of two thirds, one third split here. Um, I've got myself a long cove there, um, and instead of trying to manipulate that end to end, I want to go deeper, I'll go back to the middle and start again. Create another cove that I take out to the extremes of the, the top and the bottom. This top part here, sometimes rather than just leave that little room square as it is, I'll just take the gauge and just to shape it a little. Just makes I think it just makes it look like you've you've thought about it and you've done that deliberately rather than just left it. So I'll take this down yet further. Remember my hole in the middle is about three eighths of an inch, so I've got more I can take out of here. And the other principle I'm applying here is starting all my cuts at the top and then working back. So I'm leaving as much bulk here to support what I'm doing up here as I can rather than turn the bottom first, then the top, because then I've lost all my support. 
I would do exactly the same if I was turning the goblet or any other vessel or, or vase, I suppose, that, that is supported at one end only. You try and keep yourself as much support for those cuts as you can. All right, so I've, that's about where I want to be, I think, depth-wise. I'll finish off the other half of the cove to blend that in. And as I get closer to where I want to be, just take some lighter cuts, blend that in. And that's that's the top bit. So then I've got to figure out where's my bottom half going to be. <coughs> um, if I said my bead half of it goes from there to, let's say, about there, so that's my centre of my bead, the highest, highest point, the widest diameter. So I can do the right hand half of the bead. And I start on the corner with the flute horizontal and then rotate the flute as I go around the curve. I come back to the line. But the rule is with beads, you don't take away what wood where the, the centre line is. Because if you do that, you reduce the diameter. So I've come back to the line. I don't need to actually take the line away itself. Now the other side, I've got, I've got solid wood, so I need to make myself some room. So I'm just going to cut in there with my parting tool, just to give myself some space. So now the gauge has got somewhere to go. I'll, I'll leave enough wood there so I've got some support. And I can also do a, another cut here just to take away a bit of that surface. So I'm just giving myself plenty of room there. And then I'll start off on the left hand side and roll the other half of the bead. So again, back to the line, but don't cut where the line is itself. A light cut for the last cuts. And keep that bead rolling all the way around. And I'm keeping the tool close to my side and moving with it. I always say that the, the, the shape is formed by your body, not by your arm. So you want to keep moving with it. Into that sort of diameter, that's not too bad. So that's pretty much shaped as I want. And there's one or two little sort of bumps in that, but it's you get to the point where the little remaining bumps and ridges are best removed by actually sanding rather than trying to get rid of them with the gauge. So um, I think I've reached that point where my next step is to pick up the, the uh, abrasive on that. There's a, another quick tip for you. Here, that's um, my stack of abrasives. It's a block of wood with some saw cuts in it. Nothing more elaborate than that. Um, and you just stick your abrasives in there. So I'll start off on that with about 150 grit. So this is this is two inch abrasive cross backed, which is what I usually use. It's, it's sort of a good size to fit in the hand. So I want to sand the end here and then the side two. I'll just put my dust extractor in on so it might get a bit noisier. So I'll, I'll sand in the end first, going, cutting, using the abrasive between switched views to between about nine o'clock and six o'clock. 
So the wood's going down and away from me at the point where I'm standing. And also I'm feeling some heat there, so I'm just dropping the speed down. I'll, I'll go down to about two thirds of what speed I was turning at. So I turned at about 1500, so I dropped it down to about a thousand. Just sand that little edge. And then on the outside, I'll put my fingers behind it or my thumbs behind it, but I'm not wrapping the abrasive around my fingers. I don't want to be attached to this if it got caught on anything. So I'm trying to follow that curve without rounding over this edge on the on the rim. So I'll keep it against the curve, follow it round. And what I'm trying to achieve with the first abrasive I use is to remove all the tool marks, blemishes, any tool grain if there was any, and any other flaws and bits that I, I don't want. I'm going to colour this, so I've got to do a reasonably good job or the colour is going to show up any flaws and blemishes that I haven't sanded out. And this is the first grit, so if I don't get rid of any marks and blemishes with this grit, which is 150, then I'll put that one away and go coarser. So, so I'd go down to this one, which is 120. So if I, just, if I thought I wasn't doing a good enough job with 150, then I'd, I'd drop to 120 or, or below. Um, Depends on the word. I mean, this I probably could have got away with the 150, but just to demonstrate what I would do here, if I have to, I will go down to a lower grit. Um, you need to get all those marks out with the first abrasive you use. There's no point going finer until you've got it right. Um, because if you haven't got it out with the coarsest grit, you won't get it out with the rest. So I'll go down now to 180 grit. I've got all the marks out that... I wanted to get out. Paul, can you do a camera flip so we can see? One grain there. There we go. And then the, the side grain as well. I keep switching the abrasive around, making sure you get all of that curve sanded to the grip you want and then onto the next one which is 240 so same process again sand the end and then sand the side if you get the finish right on the first grip all the subsequent grits are doing is taking out the scratches left by the previous one. So all I'm trying to do with this 240 grit is to take out the marks that the 180 grit left and so on. The hard work's done with the first one. When, when I buy abrasives, I buy more of the coarser grits than I do with the finer grits because I use them more. But they're used to get rid of the um, tool marks and form grain and whatever else might be there so, so I tend to use more of the coarser grits than I do of the the rest of them because the rest are just improving the finish rather than doing any uh, any of the donkey work so I'm at 320 grit now I'll go one more down to well that's 320 there so I've got 400 grit I'm going to 400 grit because I'm going to colour there, so so I want quite a fine finish. Okay, turn off the extractor. So that's sanded to. 400 grit. I'll just brush that off with a, a brush. I'll do this rather than blowing the dust away because I've still got my visor on, remember, and, and ordinarily I'd be wearing the dust mask as well. I'm not now because I'm trying to talk to you, so that would make that a little bit tricky. But So um, I've not bothered with the dust mask, but ordinarily, because I've got all that on, I'm not going to be able to blow anything. 
So, uh, so the brush comes in very useful, and that always sits by my lathe. Um, so that's the initial turning process. So what I want to do now is to colour that. Um, and what I'm going to use is these. These are the, the chestnut spirit dyes. Um, this is the half a litre, uh, no, quarter litre, 250 mil containers. Um, that's, the, that's where I normally buy it. You can buy little samplers, um, a set of, I think it's nine different colours. Um, this is the, um, the bigger bottles. And I, I use that in airbrushes. And um, I'll just show you the ones I use. <clears throat> That's it. The, these are the cheapest, most basic airbrush you can get. They cost me £7.50 each, which is what, about $10. So very cheap, um, almost throwaway. But having said that, this one is the first one I've bought. I think I've probably had it for the best part of 20 years and it still works. Um, I have had to clean it occasionally, but I, I don't do that every time anyway. Um, that one, the needle sticking a bit. So I ended up buying a replacement thinking it was going to seize up on me, but it never did. I was still using it. Um, these are what they call single action airbrush. You press the trigger and you've, you, you turn the flow on. It's on or off basically with this. There's not a lot of control. Um, you can adjust the nozzle here, this little brass wheel at the front you can see i can adjust the flow into the airflow um, these are what they call siphon feed on the bottom of that let me just grab one you fit a, a bottle that just presses onto there and my paint or dye in this case goes in the bottle and it's siphoned into the airflow so by adjusting that nozzle there i adjust the amount of um, colour siphoned into the nozzle. These aren't precision tools that are going to give you um, graphics quality images, but what I'm doing here is effectively blanket coverage of colour. And for that purpose, these are absolutely perfect. They're cheap, easily available. Um, and as you can see here, I've got several of them. And I, I can put one of these on top of each color I want to use. Um, and I've got all these on a bayonet connection as well. So, so I just clip them onto my compressor. I've got a, a line here from my compressor also with a bayonet connection on it. So just push that on and I'm good to go. So, so that's the, as complex as it gets here. I can use two of these guns with two different colors. So um, as it's Christmas, I've got here red and green. So some nice Christmassy colours. Before I take those off, I'm just going to put some latex gloves on. The, otherwise, my hands would have Christmassy colours on probably for the rest of Christmas. Um, it does take a few days to wash this stuff out. <laughs> so latex gloves or nitrile gloves if you don't like latex. Just something to give you a barrier against these colours. Um, Is that an alcohol or water-based dye? These are these are spirit-based, what they call spirit-based. It's um, methylated spirits or de denatured alcohol, I think is what, what you call it, um, rather than ethanol. It's methanol-based rather than ethanol, if you see what I mean. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thin them with um, sort of methylated spirits or methyl alcohol or whatever you want to call it um so i need the tops for that got two here and you'll put some subtitles at the bottom for you guys later so i can say that again said eddie will put some subtitles up so that the guys understand what they are later on yeah. i mean i speak english i'm all right <laughs> <laughs> so there's the green and I'll just put the, the nozzle on the top so I can put that gun on there and then I've got another bottle here with the red in and put a nozzle on top of that one you bother covering the uh, the bed of the lathe at all or I'd never bother no I, I, I mean my, my, my lathe bed never, never changes colour my chuck changes colour often um, so what I do is I, I run the chuck occasionally and just put a wire brush against it. 
and and that takes all the all the build up of colours and finishes off there. I, I mean, I spray it with sand and sealer and lacquer and all sorts of things. So eventually, the chuck and the the jaws tend to build up sort of a a bit of a a, a, a colour, depending on what I've been using lately. Um, but that's all part of the sort of process. So. Um, it, it does come off fairly easy. I, I don't do it every time. Every now and again, when it builds up, just get a wire brush. In fact, this chuck, I did it earlier today. I thought, yeah, that could do with a bit of um, sort of cleaning up. So I, so I just cleaned this one up. But that was looking very um, sort of green earlier. It's not now much less so. So so that's ready to go. My compressor is set to about 30 PSI on the regulator. And I set the lay speed moderately slow as well. So what I want to do is start spraying on the end here. I'm spraying from about six inches. And I don't thin these. If I want a lighter colour, I just put less on. So the end, I'm just doing sort of solid green. The top, I'll do solid green. I'm just doing that rim. And I'll start off with heavy green at the top and just fade it out two thirds of the way down. So I'll just come to the roughly the top of the bead and fade the green from the top to there. That's enough for that one. So I can stop there. Detach my air, airline from that. Attach my other colour to the airline. If these, these nozzles need adjustment, <coughs> all I do is get a piece of scrap um, cardboard as a target or, or even just some kitchen towel like this um, and then you just point the gun at there nothing's coming out so adjust the flow a bit there you go I'm getting some colour now so, so I preset that nozzle on the air, air, air gun here to, to get the, the right amount of flow but you can see here if the, the, although I say this isn't a precision one if I go very close I can get a moderately thin line but I can't control the amount of paint coming out other than with that that nozzle so um, it's not really lending itself to precision stuff whereas the the, the dual action uh, guns are much better for that but for what I'm using it here it's absolutely perfect I'll start off the bottom with the red heavily and fade that two-thirds of the way up and I'm moving moderately slowly I don't want to put diagonal sort of bands of color in here and just fade that into there. So that's the red. So we've got red fading into green. So there's no hard line between the two. I've just faded one that way and faded the other the other way. So that's that's as much as I need to do with the airbrush at the moment. Um, what I'll do is I'll give that just a few seconds to dry. And I've got some cellulose sanding sealer here, which is just the aerosol version. I do use the liquid sanding sealer and brush it on some of my pieces of work, but when I'm using colours like this, I don't. Um, the reason for that is if you're brushing on sanding sealer, the sanding sealer will actually lift and remobilize the colours. It, it will act as a solvent and it will move them around. So you start dragging the colours with your brush. I don't want to do that, so I'm using a spray sealer to fix it where it is. So again, run the lathe fairly slowly. Light coat on the end. Then a, a light coat along the length of it. Give that 30 seconds to dry and repeat. Just enough to seal the end there. And you can do two or three light coats in a couple of minutes because it only takes 30 seconds to dry whereas if you try and do one heavy coat it will take you several minutes to dry so i just build up two or three light coats that's enough i'll just speed the lathe up just a little to speed up that drying process so that's you can leave it at that and and just put a, a wax or lacquer finish on it and call it a day um what I tend to do with these is to, because it's ash and you've got that open grain and that nice sort of open pores, is to embellish that yet further. And um, let me just grab a few 
tins here. I've got lots here, so I'm just going to bring them over by the lathe. These are um, these are made by Liberon. I've, what I've got here is liming wax. So that's white, as, as you no doubt have already come across. But you can put liming wax on that, and it will put white into the pores of the wood. And it mutes the colours a bit. If you've got something you think, oh, that looks a bit too loud, put some liming wax, and it just takes it down a, down a key or two and makes it darker. Um, I've got these in other colours. I've got a black there. If you want to make it look a little bit more intense, black's quite a good one. Um, I've also got here terracotta, which is obviously red, the verdigris, which is green, and this one they call blue moods, as the name implies, is a, a sort of a mid-blue colour. So um, those are all, all useful for, for patinating. Um, so that's some of the waxes I've got. I've got a whole pile of other tins of waxes of various colours um, by sort of various different makes, in fact. So, so there's a lot there. And, and another other ones I like to use here, this is a, a gilt cream. So it's sort of a wax-based metallic. Um, this one's gold. I've got some here, which are the chestnut ones, and I've got a gold, a copper, and a silver. So those are all quite quite nice to put colour into this. I'm just going to go with a straightforward gold. I mean, again, going with a the Christmas theme, I think red and gold, green and gold. It's all good for the Christmas theme, isn't it? Um, you can put that on with your finger. I use this um, non-abrasive web wax. You can see the, that end I've already used um, in another pot of gold. So um, I, I just save those bits and reuse them. In the bigger pots of wax, I leave the, the, the pad in there. This one's actually drying out. So we'll see how Paul, we get with it. I, may I have one second, Paul? Yep. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's 8 o'clock Central Time. Uh, I'm Captain Eddie Castle, and a moderator for Worldwide Wood Turners. We welcome you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is your Wood Turning Club. We'd like to hear from you. And if you've got questions about this demonstration in a few minutes, Paul will take those questions. And we will go back to gallery and other situations. Uh, it's all right here on Worldwide Wood Turners. Paul's going to get back to making this thing look gorgeous. Thank you, Paul. Okay. So while Eddie was talking there, I've just been rubbing this gilt cream into the grain of the wood. But you can see I've, I've effectively coated the whole thing. I've left the top. Um, if you want to put gilt wax into that too, that's up to you. This one I'm not going to, but yeah, sometimes I do. Um, I've left quite a defined edge there, so I think it's... Um, it's good just to leave it as it is. So now what I need to do is to take that excess gold off the surface. So I run the lathe, speed it up just a little bit, and just use the pressure from my, this is just ordinary kitchen towel, pressure from my kitchen towel to create some friction to melt the wax off the surface. And you can see there's, there's some coming off. I can sort of turn that another way and try again and we'll see how much we've got off. So that's that's better. There's still too much on there, I think. So what I'm going to do, this is Renaissance wax, which is just a, a clear wax. I'll just use a bit of that. Not a lot left in the bottom of there, so I'll just put it on with my finger. And just work that into the surface and then run the lathe again, and that will mobilize the, the gilt wax on the surface and take some more off. And I can repeat that as many times as I like until I think I've got as much off the surface as I need to. What I'm aiming to do here is just leave that gilt wax in the pores of the wood. So that, that's looking pretty good. So, so you can see there we've got the gilt in the pores of the wood and it's likewise on the green shows up quite nicely but not in the or on the surface of the wood so um, that's that's the effect I'm after there so what I've got left to do with this one is to part it off that's that's the final finish I've, I've effectively just wax polished that so I've, I've put wax over the top of my sanding sealer so I can just um, treat that as my final finish just taking these gloves off. 
<coughs> and then my visor back. And I just want to part this off. Um, you can go for a big part into a small one. I've got a small one here, so I'll use that. Just setting my rest up. And with a small piece like this, I'll part it most of the way off and just hold on to it. I'll brace my fingers against the rest here and just hold on to it. If that was a bigger piece, I'd, I'd cut it so far and then stop the lathe and cut it through with a saw. And what I'm going to do here is part away from the base and then cut in towards the base. And a, a tip for parting off the bottom of things here. You can see the shape of this tool. Both the top edge and the bottom edge are ground on the wheel. That's why this top edge got that curve on it. And by grinding this top edge on the wheel, I effectively put a burr on the edge. So as well as the tip cutting like a parting tool, the side of here effectively works as a cutting edge. So, so when I part close to the base here, I'm slightly undercutting, but also I'm just using the edge of the tool to clean up that edge, that cut. You know what it's like when you just go straight in with a parting tool, you end up with torn grain on the end grain. And that's exactly what would happen here. So by just carefully angling the tool, I'm just tilting it in slightly. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but I can see sort of fibres coming up off that side edge of it, so, so I know it's cutting on the edge. So that, I think, is cleaning up my surface and leaving me less to finish when I take this off the lathe. Because at the end of the day, whatever is left on that bottom, I've got to finish by hand, pretty much. <coughs> so I'm just taking a few light cuts, just clean that base up as far as possible. Now I've turned the centre down to about an eighth of an inch. And what I'm going to do is, is part that away as far away from the bottom as I can, <coughs> rather than right against the bottom. So what you can see there is I've left that little stub. And the reason for that is where I part through, those remaining few fibres twist and break. And if I part that off right against the base, that's going to break into the foot. And it's, I've got to sand a lot of wood away to get rid of it. Doing it this way, I've got very little to sand away. So um, it just makes my life easier with the uh, cleaning and finishing. So I'll take that out of the truck. And to finish up the base, one last bit here. So I've got a, th this was the bottom of something else I parted off. And you can see what I've just parted off here. It's very similar. It's one of those, it's a block off something. Um, I can put that in the truck and I just drilled it, put a Velcro sanding arbor in there. And if I start off on probably 120 grit to do here, there's only a little bit of wood to take away. I'll put my dust extractor back on. And this gives me both hands free. I'll speed the lathe up, put the base against the sanding pad there, and that little stub's gone in, in a matter of seconds. It's far safer, I think, than trying to hold on to the piece with one hand and carve it off with a skew chisel or a gouge or something in the other hand. Um, so um, for me, this is. Um, a much safer and, and probably faster way of doing it. And I'm just cleaning up the bottom there with this 120 grit. Just keeping that slice, slight con concave surface there so it's going to sit flat on anything I put it on. And that's more or less it. And then I can switch to a 180 grit. So that's, that's my wrong one.
and then I assign it by hand to 240. Just get that out of my block. So I'll just go over that with a bit of 240 grip. And then just put a little bit of wax on the bottom of it to finish it. So you again, the, your, the, well, do you sign your pieces usually? Pardon? Do you, do you sign your pieces usually? Often, yes. I've got, I've got a couple of different ways I do it. Some of them I brand them with a, a heated brand. Some, some I just sign with a pen. Um, and some I just put a sticker on it. So, um, so it depends on what it is, really. But yeah, a lot of my work I do. I mean, I, I found that um, I got people asking me to sign things. So, so I started doing it because people wanted it. Um, so yeah, I think if you're if you're trying to sell something as anything remotely artly as arty, they they sort of expect a signature on it, don't they? So that's the bottom finished. Um, and you can see there the the gilt cream picking up the the grain, and I think the the gold works well with both the red and the green there, and we sort of got semi Christmassy colours in that. So um, so that's the finished product. Very nice. Very nice. Um, Thank you. Have you got time for me to do one more? Do, do you want to call it quits there? I've, I've got another one. This one, ready, roughed. I can I can just make a second one if you if you want me to. Okay. Um, I'm a rush. What do you want me to do, Eddie? I'm all for it. Um, anybody else in the team? I'm, I'm okay all for it. I, I, I okay, Eddie. Make... I'd like to see it. Okay, I'll carry on then. So I'll make that one. As I said earlier, I've already drilled this one, so that's got a hole for my tube. Um, can um, you, this can one. You, can you do this one in English, Paul? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can see that one now. I've gone quite thin at, at, at the neck part. Um, this this one I'm turning now has got to be a little bit thicker because I've got a bigger hole. This had a three eighths hole. This one's got a sixteen mil. What's that about five eighths in in, uh, in real money? <laughs> So um, this one needs to be just a little bit thicker. Um, but you, I mean, when I'm teaching people, I use this as one, not necessarily go all the way to coloring it, but this is one of the first projects I give people to do. I get them to do the practice beads and coves and things like that on a piece of scrap wood and just learn the technique. And then I get them to apply the technique to something like this. And it's a, it's a very easy way to sort of explain that thing is it, if you can turn a bead and a cove and a v-cut and do a, a fillet as they call it you've got the four basic shapes and you can make more or less anything just by combining all those shapes so this i think is a very good practice project for doing beads and coves and the like so um i think it works well so i'm back to square one we go for that. I'll, I'll, I'll start off doing a cut across the end grain to clean that up. This one, I'm going to do a slightly different shape. Um, same process, but different shape because I can. So I just squared off the end to get my uneven saw cut. Adjust the um, rest to get me cutting more or less on centre with the gauge horizontal. Because where I want, again, I'm putting my flute at 60 degrees to the left, so I'm pointing the flute at my left shoulder approximately. I want the cut to be halfway down this left wing. So I'm adjusting the height of my rest, so that's, that's cutting at approximately 9 o'clock. So just adjust the rest there and start my cut at nine o'clock and bring that gauge back towards me and swing the handle and that cuts the shape. If, if I'm sort of feeling like it, sometimes I'll cut the wrong way and I'll cut against the grain, knowing that I'll probably get a worse surface, but 
sometimes it's quicker to do that to remove the waste and then cut the right way when it matters. So when I'm approaching the shape I want, then I cut back the other way. But on this piece, it's not going to take me long to actually hollow that or to, to, to shape the inside here. And all I'm doing is a very simple trumpet shape in a way, I sort of flaring it out just to lead the top into the hole in the middle. And what I also do with these, because I'm putting a tube in, is just check that I've gone down far enough with the flare. I need to go about another eighth of an inch or so. So I need to do a couple more cuts just to flare that in. That should do it. Sometimes with these, um, with the tubes, depending where you get them from, sometimes they have a little step on the, the little shoulder at the top of the tube. The ones I've got now don't, they're just dead straight. But occasionally I get ones that have got a little shoulder on the top. And um, I'm just looking for the tool. And what I normally do with those, I've got here, it's a, a, a square scraper. It's actually a round bar, but it's a square scraper. Um, what I'll do is I'll bring the square scrape in and just cut a little recess at the top. So the, the, um, the little rim on the top of the tube will just sit into the little recess I cut. Um, don't need to do it with this one because they're straight tubes. So yeah, just one to watch out for if you are buying these tubes. So if we get the one with steps in, remember I warned you about that Ooh. one. Um, so need to just check the depth of my hole. So I know where to make the bottom of my vase. So I got just using a knockout bar as a depth gauge here. So there's the bottom of my hole just there. So I know from, from that, I've got to make my bars at least as long as that. Otherwise, the hole's going to go all the way through, and that's what, not what we need. So we'll have a bit at the bottom, let's say an inch on top of that. So there's roughly where the bottom of my bars is going to be. And I know my hole isn't going to go all the way through. How about camera change, Paul? Okay. There we are. Or we can uh, yeah, do that with the inset. So I'll just trim up the top part. So as, be, as before, if it wasn't quite square, that wasn't quite round, that wouldn't matter too much. Um, I've got my bottom there, so that's not a problem. So this one, I'm just going to put a narrower cove at the top. Mm. Remember this, all the cuts, again I'm cutting with the grain, so I'm cutting edge to centre now, that's cutting with the grain. So I cut to the middle and then stop, come back to the other side, and do the same from the other side. I don't want to cut back up the other side, because I'll be cutting against the grain. Um, there's a, also a danger because the bevel isn't actually fully controlled in the cut, but the, the tool's going to cut. So um, if you keep that cut going edge to centre on this, you're minimising the chances of you getting a catch as well. That's about deep enough. I just want to shape that top a little bit more. Okay, so that's the top half, and I just want to work on the bottom half. This one, I'm going for what I, I sort of call a slightly more 
sort of Grecian style. So the widest point will be there. So I'm actually elongating my bead and making it asymmetrical. So I start off at the top, round the top over a little, and then the bottom half will come down to my pencil line at the bottom. And that's probably slightly longer than I want this to be. I think proportion-wise, I just want to shorten it a little. So I'll just be checking where my pencil mark is and in terms of where I can make the foot. So I'll just make myself a bit of space. Just use my guys just to relieve that corner. So we've got plenty of room. I'll start on the corner, rounding that over. Working back to my pencil line, but as before, not cutting the line away. I'm, I'm not going crazily small on the base because I've the, the intention with this, with the tube in it, is to actually put a, a flower in it of some sort. Um, so you want a little bit of stability there. So I'm not going to go too small with the foot because I want that stability. Um, but you, you want it's the foot small enough to make the shape work. If your foot's too big, you've not got a lot of scope for forming the curve you want. So um, it's, it's swings and roundabouts. You've got to decide the compromise between stability and and shape. And, and in this case, stability is a, is a definite factor. So that's got to be part of my consideration here. Whereas if it was purely a decorative thing and I didn't, didn't put um, a tube or a flower in it, it's, all it's got to do is support itself. And, and for that, I can make the foot much smaller. Right, so I'll bring my dust hood in again. So I'll start the sanding again. I'll sand the end grain. Just drop that speed down a bit, what I remember. This one, I didn't shake that edge rim much. I wanted to leave it square on this one. I just put my finger behind the paper and folding it over so I can get into that cove. Sometimes you could put a thumb behind it like that and do the same. Just get in there and sand that cove and then on the longer curve of the bottom half So as before, I want to get rid of all my tool marks, any little bumps and ridges, etc., any torn grain, if there is any, before I move on to the next grit, which will be 180. And the rule of thumb is you don't go down by more than half the number. So from 120, half of that is 60. So 120 and 60 is 180. So that's the next grit. Don't go farther than that. And then from 180, Half of that is 90, so you're up to 270. So your next grip will be 240 or 270. Um, I mean, what I've got on the shelf in next to that is, is 240. So that's my next grip. And, and so on down the, down the range from, from 240, I go to 320 and then 400 and then 600, 800, 1200. If, I've, if I need to go further, I don't often go that fine. It depends on the wood I'm using, but for something like this, 400 grit is far enough. Um, if I wasn't colouring it, I'd probably stop at 320. And we've got, that's the 320 I've got now. Somebody said to me once, um, Use your abrasive like someone else is paying for it. 
a very good tip, I think. And um, what they mean by that is once it's worn out, throw it away, get a fresh piece. Um, it's, it's like any cutting tool. If it's not sharp, it's not going to cut effectively. It'll start to burnish your wood rather than cutting it. So um, that one, I think, is spent. So I'll throw that away. I've got another one here that's sort of in my rack as well. So I'll use that one. So we're done at 320, no, 400. Yeah, with all these waxes, occasionally, they, or after a while, they go hard. Um, what I do with mine is I put them in a, a double boiler. You put them in a pan of hot water, basically, melt the wax, and then add a bit of terps, um, turpentine or turpentine substitute. And um, don't add a lot, just a, a couple of teaspoonfuls, probably. Um, and then as, as the wax cools, keep stirring it to keep the colour um, sort of fluid in it. Otherwise, it, it, particularly with the metallics, I find sometimes the, if you don't stir it, the, the, the metallic particles, etc., start to settle out. So you need to stir it. Um, but that revives it and makes it flow and uh, usable again. So again, back to colouring. So I'm going to put my gloves back on. What kind of wood is that? This is ash. It's, it's a great wood for doing this with because it's it's a light coloured wood and is a, a good canvas for putting the coloured dyes on. And, and it's quite an open poured wood, so it lends itself to the grain fill techniques as well. I mean, I could just put grain fill on that, not put any colour on it. Um, I'm just trying to see if I've got any bits like that I can show you. No, I don't think I have. Thank you. I've got a couple here. Th these aren't ash, but um, these have had a grain fill. This one's oak, and I've done a verdigris grain fill on it. So you can just pick up the green in the grain. And all I've done is sanding that, put sanding sealer on it, and then the, the, the verdigris wax. This one, same process, but with liming wax, so it's got white in the grain. So um, you can do that with any of those open poured woods oak, um, elm, ash, um, sweet chestnut, um, acacia, they all work well with this. Right, so colours, I'm going to use different colours this time, or one different colour. Right, so I'll start off with the green, the same green as I used before, and I'll use a dark blue with it. Just plug in my compressor. So I'll turn the lays down to run fairly slow. And as before, green on the end. I usually do the lighter colour at the top and the darker colour at the bottom. Um, red and green, they're probably 50-50. You could do that either way. But this time with a d very dark blue and the green, it's definitely blue at the bottom and the, the dark green, at, uh, so, so the dark blue at the bottom and the green at the top. And as before, fading out the green into the bottom half, sort of quite dense green at the top. These are, being, being as they are dyes, they're, they're transparent um, and you can combine them by spraying one over the top of the other. So if you want to mix colours, you can just spray one and then spray the other over it to, to shade it and um, sort of modify the colour. So um, you're, you're not stuck to using sort of one colour or another and, and blending them in the gun. You can, you can blend them on your 
work piece if, if that's the way you want to go with it just by spraying one over the top of the other that one's looking good as it is you can see there the the blue i'm using i'm just trying it out on the pad before spraying it onto the wood you see how much flow i've got so strong blue at the bottom and fade out as i go so i'm gradually building this up you can see the amount of colour I'm putting on there, but we just angle that camera a little more, you can see the airbrush as well. There we go. So I'm moving the gun slowly, concentrating at the bottom, keeping that thicker, heavier colour at the bottom and then fading it out as I go at the side. But moving it slowly, I don't want to put diagonal bands of colour in it, they're just a horizontal sort of graduation is all I'm aiming for here. So that's good. That's all I need to do with the colour. Just turn off my airbrush there. So I'll just leave that a minute to to dry. And again, I'll overseal that with some sanding sealer. This stuff does dry pretty quick. It being, being as it's spirit, spirit based, it, the, the spirit evaporates off fairly quick. So I don't really need to do anything to accelerate that just give it a minute that'll be touched dry already but by the time i've shaken up my can pretty much ready to go so the sand and sealer goes over the dye yes yeah what, I, what i'm doing is putting the sand and sealer over the dye to seal the dye in and also to prevent to create a barrier between the wood and the, and the wax I put on as the, as the grain fill. So I can then buff it off the surface. So a bit on the end. So if I was, if I was using the grain fill wax or something like that on, um, on just a plain uncolored piece of wood, I'd still put the sand and sealer on to seal the wood. So you do that before you put the wax on. And as before, two or three coats light coats just to get that sealed that should be enough and i'll give that a minute to dry so i'm going to choose a different wax this time but um so i'll go for a metallic no i'll, I'll skip the metallics I'll, I'll just go for a straight black that's quite a, a good one that will make this look a little bit deeper and more intense whereas the white will take it the other way it makes it look a little bit more pastel so you can see there i've already got my pad in there. i'll leave it in the tin we've got that color on you give that a minute just to give it time to dry that's firm but it's, it's still usable i've had i've had these tins for quite some time actually because it's a big tin like that it takes an awful long time to use it use one of those um so yeah they do last me quite a long time all well, so, if i may for a moment um just sure. 30 minutes after the hour i want to let everybody know you tuned into worldwide wood turners this is paul hannaby and his website is on the bottom of the screen creativewoodturning.com and paul's off to do this demonstration tonight tonight for us and we're still soliciting demonstrators. If you'd like to be part of the program, just let us know. Our website is worldwidewoodturners.org. And there's a contact sheet on there. Um, and you're invited to be part of all aspects of this club. Thank you, Paul. Paul Hannaby is going to make this thing gorgeous. I get it. So I'm just working that wax into the grain. And I'll give it a minute to dry. I'll put that pad back in the tin and leave it there for the next time. So um, that's good to go the next time I need it. So grab myself a bit of kitchen towel. Fold it up. And um, you, you can leave this for a few minutes to dry if, if, it's, if it's quite soft. This, this is already fairly, fairly firm, so I don't think I need to wait. And I'll just start off at the top. Again, I've not put any wax on the top. You can if you want, but I've just chosen not to. I've done the rim. I've done this 
top rim here and you can see the black coming off as I'm buffing it. What I'm trying to do here is, is just, just use the pressure of my pad, which is kitchen towel, to create friction to melt the wax off the surface. So that's what the sand and sealer is doing. It's creating that barrier and I'm buffing the wax off that surface that this sand and sealer has created for me. Because I don't want the black to be on the surface, I just want it to be in the grain. And with all these coloured waxes, another one I do sometimes, I might do a red and a black, and on the black I put red wax, and on the red I put black wax. Um, still too much black on that for my liking, so I'll dip into my tub of my, my finishing wax. Effectively, this is this is what this one is. This, this is a just to clear Renaissance wax, which is what I use for finishing. Put some of that on just to soften the wax. That I've put on the to, to, so I can see so you see now I'm taking off more black. That's what I want to do. If, if you want, you can also do this with a finishing oil if if that was your chosen finish. So um, it, it works in the same way. A bit more wax on there to to lift off the black, so more clear wax to lift off. But whatever your chosen finishing wax is, it doesn't have to be well to do this. And you can even make up your own coloured waxes. If you've got some paste wax, get a little bit of that and mix some powdered pigment, powdered paint or anything like that in it. Um, I'll just show you a quick one. That's, that should be done. Yeah, that's looking good. So we've got the black picking up the grain there. Um, that little pot there, don't know how well you can see it, but that's ochre powdered rock. Um, this is natural ochre pigment, which is powdered rock. And this is mined five miles down the road from me. There's a little cave. Um, there's a tourist attraction. You can know, go down there and see the cave. They, they, they've filmed like episodes of Doctor Who and other things down these caves. They're, they're a bit sort of um, weird and wacky with some of the rock formations. So they use it for filming occasionally. But they, they mine these pig. It's, it's an iron oxide of some sort. Um, and this part of the world is is well known for for iron workings dating back to to the Iron Age. Basically, um, there's a, there's sort of archaeological evidence of workings going back to the Iron Age, and um, obviously there's the the iron ore is there, and um, that's what they used to make these ochre pigments. And, and artists use them to make some of the paints used for oil paints and stuff. And um, I've used some of that pigment in the past and mixed it with a bit of finishing oil and sort of made my own oil paint and painted that on the wood and that works quite nicely. But yeah, you can mix it with a bit of wax and do a grain fill with it. And I quite like that. It's, it's a natural sort of earthy colour. It's almost a purple, but it's quite a, a browny sort of natural earthy colour. So I just need to part that one off. Same process as before. I'm just going to sharpen my parting tool. That should do it. And as before, I start passing off away from the base and then work in. Leaving myself about a half inch stub. And when I get right up to the base, that last cut, I'm just angling the tool so I'm cutting on the edge. And by the edge, I mean this part up here, not the tip. I mean, the tip's doing its bit, but if I just tip the tool slightly to the right, I'm cutting on this edge using that burr I've just put on it to clean up the base. So I have much less sanding to do to, to finish off the base. Well, I'm taking this down to about a quarter inch stub. And then at that point, I'll just hold on to that. 
reduce that down to about an eighth of an inch. Again, using the edge of my tool to try and get a clean cut on the base and part it off away from the foot, like that. So again, I've left that stub there. So all those little broken twisted fibers are on that stub, not propagating back into my foot. So I can sand that off very quickly with my little um, sanding arbor, which I've got here. But that, as I said, that's just a piece of something else I've parted off. And that sanding arbor is just a good fit in the hole. I just drilled a hole that was a, a snug fit. So um, it's not glued in or anything. Right, so I just need to sand that. But on the base, you stop sanding at 320, is that correct? Say that again, sorry? I said when you were sanding the base itself, you stopped sanding at a 320 grit? 400. 400, okay. Yeah, we, with the coloured stuff, I would normally sand to 400. If it, were, if it was plain wood, with ash, I'd probably sand to 320. Um, but yeah, on, on this... Because I'm colouring it, I go a little bit finer. So, so here, um, I mean that's that's an 80 grit pad. I can use that just to take the stub away. That's all I need to do with that, really. Then I'll switch down to 120. I mean, I probably could have done this at 120, but uh, just to show you the process if it's a bigger stub, really. Sand the foot. Sand that middle part where I took away the stub. And then onto the 180. <laughs> and just a um, little bit of wax onto the bottom of that. There's still enough left on my pad there to to do that and then just buff that i don't bother with the sanding sealer on the bottom just just straight wax go straight onto the wax just take off the dust so there's the blue and green with the black grain fill looks amazing great job paul really very good. nice fantastic paul. So you, can see, you can see the, okay, the black sort of Given it a sort of a darker sort of feel to it, it's, it's made the colours, I, I think, a little bit more intense. Whereas if I'd gone for the liming wax, it takes the whole thing lighter. It makes it a little bit more pastel in appearance. But um, I like the way it just works with the grain and um, enhances the grain. You can see at the top there, there's no, no wax fill on that. I decided not to do that on the top, but you, you can if you want. And then once that's done, plastic tube and... That drops in there. And that's it. Very nice. Very, very okay. nice. Anyone got any questions? Thank you so much. I really learned a lot on this one. That's good. Okay. Great uh, demo. That, that's the objective. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Paul. Best thanks. Too. I just wanted to point out that your, your chuck, um, when you have it closed and stuff, the uh, jaws are not sticking out. And they're as close as possible. They really grip that wood really good. Um, yeah, you can so see there. Yeah, they're actually just below the diameter of the chuck. I've got a, I've got an opening there, um, about three sixteenths. I sort of aim for sort of quarter of an inch or just below. But but yeah, that's what what I'm aiming for here is when my let me just take that out. When my piece of let me put on the other camera. What what I'm trying to achieve here is for the jaws to form a perfect circle. And when they're open about that much, which is three sixteenths to a quarter of an inch, 
that's the perfect circle. So, so I make my spigot that big. Um, that, well, at least that's what I aim for. These, these are the ones I've just made um, that I've parted off the bottom of these things. That's where my spigot should be, just there. So when I tighten down on it, I've got effectively two perfect circles meshing together. So I've got maximum grip across the the jaw. If 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 I and I can see here from the mark, I don't know how well that shows up on the camera, but I can see here from the marks the chuck's left that they're pretty much uniform across the width of the jaw because of that matching of the circles. If I make my spigot too small and I, I close the jaws down like this so they're almost all the way closed, what's going to happen is my piece of wood is going to touch the centre of each of those four jaws. So I'm reducing grip because I'm losing grip off the corners. And if I go the other extreme, let's say I make my spigot that big, then what's going to happen is it's going to touch the corners of the jaws rather than all the way across. So again, I'm reducing grip. So to get maximum grip, I want that to be a perfect circle and that's, that's, that's where it should be. So, so that's why the jaws are, are not sticking out a long way because at that point there, that's, that's where, where it should be. But I mean, going back to the jaws sticking out at that point there, that's roughly where these are made. That's machined out of a single billet and, and turned and then they saw it into four. And that's about how much they take out on a saw cut. I've actually been to the factory and seen these being made. So, so I know that they take two saw cuts and they take about that much metal away. So I know at that point, I'm about right for, for that being a perfect circle. Right. I don't measure the, the gap in the jaws, but I, can, I, I just eyeball it, give it, give or take a, a 16th, you, you, you're close enough. Um, and I can do that by eye because at that point, the the jaws are actually the same diameter as the chuck, so it's, it's fairly straightforward. And, and by default, it stops the jaws sticking out. So, so I don't have the jaws like that sticking out um, where there are corners to catch or where the carriers, you can see at that point, the carriers are sticking out. Let me go to overhead cam. You can see the, the carriers here are now sticking out as well. So a, an added sort of possibility of ca catching your knuckles on the carriers as well as the jaws. So, um, yeah. Keeping that down to the to the right diameter makes it a little bit safer for us all. Yeah, keeps that meat grinder away, you know. Thank you. Thanks for explaining that, Paul. It was very good. Thank you. Oh, can you show both those pieces at the together? Yeah. Of course. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Retain that shape because you guys have 27 hours till Christmas to get them done. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, you can see both of those are just a combination of, of effectively a cove and a bead. Nothing more complicated than that. It's just different proportions. Um, it's the same cut. This one's a, a small cove and a, an elongated bead. That's a, a longer cove and a shorter bead. But um, if you can do a cove and a bead, you can do that. Certainly can. Very nice. Any other questions for Paul? Just one there. I wanted to ask, my understanding is the finer you sand it, the less the dye will penetrate. Is that correct? I think you're correct, yes. Okay. Um, it, it still does absorb. Um, the, the difference is how much. And um, I mean, with I, I use the dyes in a different process on, on figured woods. And there I, I might do this first sand into 120 and put a color on. Then I sand to 180 and put a second color on and so on. And each time I sand, I'm taking off some of the color. So you're building up layers of color. And each time you sand it, you get different absorption um, in different areas. So you actually don't get one homogenous color across the piece of wood. You get different colors on different parts. And um, I think it's combining the figuring in the wood with that, um, the absorption at different grits. Um, so yeah, it does, it does make a difference. Okay, that's what I was wondering about. I, I don't have much experience with colors there. I'm kind of a brown and brown guy, but yep. That... Anybody else tonight? With that, folks, we're going to move on back to gallery in a few minutes. But first, I got to say, Paul Hanneby did an awesome job for us tonight. He gave us two demonstrations, <laughs> and remember, we all can participate. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.